Good morning and welcome to today's webinar, Change and Opportunity for Mexico's Food Retail Sector. My name is Karin Fubre and I am the manager of Holland House Mexico. Holland House Mexico is the bilateral chamber of commerce between the Netherlands and Mexico. And we are a not-for-profit organization aimed to contribute to the success of Dutch companies in Mexico. Among our activities, we offer soft lending services to Dutch companies interested in entering the Mexican market. And we will talk a little bit more about that later on in the presentation. Uh, please, uh, before we go any further, I would like to inform you that this session is being recorded and the recording and the presentation will be shared with you upon uh, conclusion of the event. Uh, please feel free to use the Zoom chat for any questions or comments you might have for, uh, during the presentation. Um, for today's program, first of all, we will be listening to Sheila Marquez. Uh, she will do a present uh, the, study, uh, the presentation of the study Opportunities for Dutch Businesses in the Mexican Food Retail Sector. This is a, a study that has been conducted by Holland House in Mexico over the past uh, few months, uh, about three months, uh, the last month of last year and the first two months of this year. Um, this um, study was commissioned uh, by NLM Business, who are also um, joining us today. Uh, further on, we will be listening to Dan Daniel Reitsma, who will be speaking about the impact of COVID-19 on the food and beverage business, and then particularly uh, Netherlands to Mexico. Um, at a quarter to 10, we will be listening to Eric Plessier, who will be speaking about the implications of the EU-Mexico FTA for Dutch food retail products on the Mexican market. Uh, and Eric is the Agricultural Councillor of the Embassy of the Netherlands in Mexico. Uh, and lastly, we will be listening to Ana Laura Mercado Cruz from Corporativo EO, who will be explaining the NOM 51, which are the new labeling requirements for food and non-alcoholic products in the Mexican market, which will uh, be in effect uh, starting the, the 1st of October of this year already. And so without further ado, I would like to introduce to you Sheila Marquez, uh, our uh, coordinator for the sector agri-food and horticulture at Holland House Mexico. Sheila? Yeah, thank you Karin and good morning to all of, of you. Welcome and thank you for being with us today. My name is Sheila Marquez and I am pleased to share today the results of this investigation that was concluded earlier this year. Uh, next, Karin. So this is the agenda I will follow today. It is divided in three subjects. Uh, first, the Mexican market, uh, some demographics, how is the market moving, and some trends within the food retail sector to have the big picture first. Then the starting part, like the opportunities, uh, some tangible opportunities for Dutch companies in Mexico. We explore for four categories. It is important to mention that this is especially, especially for prepackaged food of bread and bakery, dairy, meat and meat substitutes, and organic and fine food. And third, also some uh, suggested points of sale for these products. So uh, first of all, um, I would like to say that in the middle of all the global pandemic situation, we have all faced different and tough times all around the world. And uh, the food sector has seen relevant changes within the consumers and the dynamics per se. Mexico is no exception for this. But one important fact that I would dare to say that we may all agree on is that the agri-food sector is essential for the well-being and is getting more and more attention, not only from the governments, but uh, all around the world, but also from the citizens who are the final consumers. So with this said, this presentation is aimed at Dutch companies, large or SMEs, to find in Mexico a potential business partner when thinking into diversifying their markets. And I will start, start explaining briefly the demographics in Mexico to, to have the big picture. So I wanted to uh, start with this image just to visualize the actual size of Mexico compared to Europe. Mexico is a large country. Uh, we have a large market, but it's important to understand the market. Next, please. Now, uh, some demographics uh, relevant. Uh, Mexico is the second largest population in Latin America, just after Brazil. We are 125 million inhabitants, and there is a high, high concentration of the population within urban areas, almost reaching 76% of it. Now, regarding purchasing power, next, Karen, please. 
as a result of a continuous economic growth, almost 40% corresponds to the middle class, which uh, would be the targeted audience for two reasons. First is the average age of Mexico is 20% of the, uh, the average age of the population. This means is we are a young country and the purchasing power relies into this segment of the, of the citizens. And the second reason is that food is a central part of the Mexican culture, but it is consumed outside or at their own or prepared at their own places. And as you can see on the right side, you see this graphic of the spending behavior from the mostly average income. Almost 36% is spent on food. This is high, high uh, uh, percentage for this for this category. So uh, now, regarding to the trend, according to Tanfar or Mintel or some uh, instruments like this, there are three drivers that are uh, that are indicating the trends not only in Mexico but globally. The first one would be sustainability, and people want to be part of the big movement towards more conscious food uh, consumption patterns. The second one would be ingredients, that people is getting more informed about what the, uh, the ingredients and their origin and the processing of the products for better quality. And the third, uh, that is, is uh, for Mexico uh, specifically, that people want more food uh, uh, experiences, more diversity in this including foreign food and trends and products. So this is the, now we go to the big part, to the starting part, where are the opportunities in Mexico for Dutch businesses? And first, a key fact is that the Mexican culture is extremely influenced by industries coming from the US. Our geographical proximity and our commercial exchange with the US has great impact on the economy. Uh, but nonetheless, people are in constant search of innovative products coming from a different country rather than the US. And here's where Europe uh, enters. European products are perceived as a high quality, uh, desirable products, and European companies can take advantage of this status. So after all the uh, study that we made, we went to the stores physically, we took photos and everything. Uh, we concluded there is a large opportunity in, in one big sector. And I will start explaining this and then uh, every category and some opportunities per each. So uh, the opportunities rely here in European fine food and organic food. I forgot to write there the slash uh, sustainable food. When I say this is that um, this, this uh, category is considered exclusive or high prestige level. Uh, there are three factors for, uh, excuse me. The first is high density of the young population, as I just previously mentioned. The second is increasing demographic curve that is uh, happening in Mexico. The third one is the middle class category that is increasing. And the fourth one is that the concern for well-being and sustainability. So the trend, the global trends and the, in the Mexican trends all rely into this. And this, this leads to higher demand in the organic food sector. And when I say organic, it's not precisely the uh, products that have the label organic certification there. But it, for example, Tony's Chocolonely is a good example that uh, they, the slogan is like non-slavery chocolate or fair trade chocolate. So these are certifications or labels that could help to your product enter the, the Mexican market. And it serves also as a complement to the lifestyle along with the exercise and well-being. And the targeted audience is um, within all the three areas that I have just mentioned. And it's important also to say that in the last 10 years, the organic food market in Mexico has grown with an average of 10% annually. Uh, and yes, people are becoming more conscious of what enters their body. Uh, they want to know that organic products uh, their products are free of chemicals or pesticides, fertilizers or other substances and also fair trade uh, practices and, the, and hence they are trying to buy healthier options. So let's start with the first category. Uh, this is one of the most important food sectors in Mexico, only after corn tortilla industry and well tortilla is really important here in Mexico. So uh, you can see two photos here. 
The first one is from a supermarket and the second one is a franchise. This is a French, uh, French franchise in Mexico. Uh, but first I would like to explain uh, why I'm, I'm showing these images. Um, this sector is really big. One of the biggest players in Mexico is Bingo. And this sector, you can see here that more than 60,000 official establishments um, are registered into this category. But this is also a sector uh, with a lot of informal commerce. And more of, a lot of these are family business. So when only focusing into these official establishments, uh, handcraft, handcrafted bakery occupies 20% of this market. And why are they baking and why am I am mentioning this? The consumption per capita in Mexico of bread is uh, almost 34 kilograms, and they are distributed in these two uh, subcategories, white bread and sweet bread. When I uh, say white bread, I'm saying this kind of bread that you see in the photo of your upper, side, upper right side. Uh, this is a photo of the supermarket where you can see that the bread box is already packaged and pre-sliced, and they offer a wide variety of bread. So, um, it's important to mention this because they, they, these, vari these variations are uh, sold. It all depends on the brand, the package, the size of the package. Um, the package are also adapted to the wholesale stores, and they can go up to 43 slices per each package. Um, almost all the variations announced that they have been added with minerals, uh, minerals of vitamins. And they are trying to go into this line of sustainable food, but this is a whole industry and Bimbo is a big, big player. So people is uh, looking for healthier options. Um, and if you see to the, to the photo uh, below, you see Mason Cater there, and they may offer the same uh, pastry that we, in Mexico also, as you can see, 30% of this consumption is uh, going to the, sweet pastries and yes this is a specialized and they're trying to sell some french pastries or type french but uh you may find more or less the same uh, bread from bimbo or made from cater but the difference is that it relies on the quality and the price so for example if you see one uh, product that's that's called concha then concha would uh, i don't know maybe is sold around seven pesos and if you go to mason Kaiser, then it would be around maybe 50, uh, 50 pesos so the difference is really really high and this is what people are is looking for the new experience is higher quality from the dove or the chocolate Next, please. people is looking for uh, well bakeries from small medium large or, or supermarkets are baking their own bread and people is looking for this fresh bread but here I, uh, you can see this traffic light system that we have tried to develop for you. To the left side, you see like in red, the, the categories of subcategories that are, have no, that option, that more opportunity in Mexico. To your right, you, have, you can see here the bake of products such as biscuits and cookies and also bread with unique selling points. So this is a, a shelf of a store called Liverpool here in Mexico City. And there, there is uh, already some uh, number of uh, products, of Dutch products, but you see that the same line. Uh, you be competitive, it must be in the sustainable uh, trend and also like uh, the high quality coming from Europe. Next, please. Now, when it comes to dairy, this is the second category. Um, if you go to a supermarket, you will always find uh, three top brands in Mexico. The first one is Lala, Alpura, and Grupo Femsa, which is from Coca-Cola. And the same as bread. They offer a wide variety of products of these so three subcategories. And if you see in the, in the image, you see a lot of colors, a lot of presentations, different packages. And this means they are offering the same product, but in different presentations, such as lactose-free, sugar-free, uh, fat-free, etc. And the domestic production, production meets the, the domestic demand. And um, these variations go, can go from size, from 200 milliliters packages to pre-armed packages of yogurt, gallon or fresh milk. Um, and all these variations that I just mentioned from sugar-free, et cetera. 
So uh, this is important to mention as um, pasteurized milk is also a good opportunity here. Uh, I will explain this further on. But first that I would like to say that from this household, 10% is spent in dairy. And this is important to, to bear in mind. And also this uh, data of the trade balance, Mexico is not focused in exporting as a national market is more than enough for the big producers. But when it comes to import trade, uh, you can see that 80% of these are, uh, Mexico is importing non-final products, such as you can see here, skimmed milk, butter fat, casein or other types of cheese that uh, they use to process and then to make the final product. So considering these two facts, it demonstrates that the opportunities for the products that have long shelf life. And uh, in the image below, you see one photo of the uh, variety of cheeses. Cheese is one ingredient uh, really used in the Mexican cuisine, but in general, they use the national cheese. So this opportunity also relies, can you go to the next please? Here. So you have also the traffic light system. You go to the right and you see the fresh products because the national demand, uh, uh, the national production, sorry, is uh, already meeting this demand. But if you go to the opportunities, then you have, as you know, this is a photo, a recent photo of uh, some grown cheeses that are sold in some supermarket. And people have in mind already that that cheese is high quality product. But if you don't want to sell the same product or that cheese, if you see that it's saturated or something, then you could go to pasteurized milk, such as this one. I put this image because this is a brand that comes from the US. And the demand of this type of, of uh, plant-based milk is, is increasing. Soy, almond, um, old meat, etc. And we don't have a lot of that, uh, those brands. And Usually these brands come from the US. And uh, also one important uh, opportunity here would be powder and canned products, such as baby powder. These have long shelf life and uh, are not produced widely by domestic Mexican brands. Uh, there are already available baby powders, are Nestle or, or some other freezer products. And the most recent entry of Cabrita of House Nutrient. So in terms of milk and fresh dairy products, an opportunity would be to work with a local Mexican producer when it comes to fresh products, but in general, the products who have also long shelf life and have also these uh, towards, that are got towards the sustainable model. So uh, regarding meat, the third category, I, it's important to say that you have here to the left the list of the three most consumed, poultry, pork, and beef. And this is just because of their price. Poultry is around 40 pesos per kilogram, and beef can go up to 30, uh, 300 pesos, sorry. Uh, so the difference is really huge. And to the upper right side, you see this chart. And we, um, with some data of one national association of beef and meat in general, we discovered that there are two big groups of uh, meat uh, buyers. And the first one is, if you put it in these two subcategories, then would you, you would have the lower, the lower income uh, uh, consumers who the, the main and the most important buying driver is the price. So you would go, to, they would go to the butcher shop, which, are, which generally have these uh, meat products in, at a lower price. But if you go to this, the group of the higher income, then the, the first or the main buying driver would be quality and freshness. And generally in the supermarket, as they have more uh, control of the quality and certifications, then the meat they would uh, find there would be, yeah, with, with uh, higher quality. This is a photo of a wholesale store that it's called Costco, but this is primarily in, uh, meat imported from the US also. So there is a big opportunity here. Uh, people also uh, perceive imported meat as a meat with higher quality than the national one. So they, 
they meat is a staple of the daily life in Mexican uh, consumers, but they are they see also like a, a non affordable good for a daily basis diet. And in supermarkets, for example, chicken is found in a range of forms, as they is the, the cheaper one. You could be you can find the whole chicken, the breast with bone, or the breast without bone, or just individual parts, uh, or with, with or without skin. So these are relevant facts to to bear in mind to see where would you like to go if you want to to bring meat in Mexico. And also some relevant facts is that beef. Beef that is imported from Argentina and the U.S. is 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 extremely uh, perceived as high quality meat, and especially the beef from Argentina is uh, consumed mostly in the horeca sector, so in restaurants or, or hotels. And the the imports that you see that the trade balance is eighty percent, as the same as the dairy. They are not Mexico is not importing finer products. But instead, uh, Mexico is importing lower, lower valued cuts, uh, such as flank steak, shank, and other low value cuts. Uh, these for processing, and then they would um, enhance it and sell it where it's uh, sell, sold here in Mexico or uh, to export it. But generally, Mexico is importing just uh, these low value cuts. Next, please. And now one big category with a huge opportunity would be meat substitutes. In Mexico, the meat substitute sector was uh, slower to enter the Mexican market than other markets. You see here one screenshot that I just took this, uh, this, this week. Mr. Tofu is one of the first online web shop which imports and distributes uh, meat substitutes in Mexico. But it's important to say Mr. Tofu was founded uh, in 2014, so it's really a young company. Uh, however, since then, the store has recorded growth rates of 80% annually. So this says a lot of, uh, of this segment that is growing. And this is a, an example of one product that also comes from the US and it's called Beyond Meat. This is the vegetable based meat um, product. And this uh, brand entered the market with Mr. Tofu in 2018. So it's a really, really recent. It's really a young industry. And obviously this is sold at a higher price than the, the real meat. So the chance that people with lower income who are less likely to visit these supermarkets is, is, is smaller, but you have a niche, um, niche segment that could buy this, this time of meat. And I will explain further on the, where you can sell uh, these kind of products. Uh, next please. So also here, you have the traffic light system and you can see the red and green lights. So when it comes to meat substitutes, as I have just mentioned, this is a huge opportunity for your product. It also, it has the same characteristics, long shelf life and also unique selling points uh, such as the meat substitute. But when it comes to pork, for example, uh, this demand will go higher now that the uh, well, the free trade, trade agreement was recently signed, but still not ratified, but it would drop the tariff from maybe from 40% to zero. So this would uh, make Dutch companies or Euro European companies even more competitive, considering the, the, the competition or the main competitor, which, which is uh, US, who has a zero tariff now with Mexico. So this is uh, a very strong sport market, and the opportunities rely here specifically. So now that, uh, okay, I know the products, I know that European fine products and organic or sustainable products have the big opportunity here. Uh, where can I buy it? Where can I enter? So as I explained in the, in the beginning, this is a, a huge country, and, well, a big country. And it's, it's um, a bit confusing if you go to the monthly average income because there is a, a lot of difference between city to city or even in the same city. But I, I tried to point here some of the main metro metropolitan areas in Mexico. And usually people are always going to say that the, the main area, the main uh, selling point would be three, that would be Mexico City, Guadalajara, Monterrey. 
But there is, uh, for example, there is in the center of, of the country, a place called San Miguel de Allende in Guanajuato, which has a lot of foreign tourism. And there is a niche, uh, uh, yeah, an, a niche audience there for a big opportunity, but it's important to know where is it and why I'm going to sell in other cities than it's not Mexico City, for example. But these are the metropolitan areas in general. Um, it is suggested to start with one of these, just because they have a, a stronger logistical infrastructure and uh, also larger customer groups. So, and they also house most of the importing or distributing agencies in Mexico. So specifically, the, the, the places to sell your products would be uh, divided in three. These are supermarkets aimed at a, a medium or medium uh, higher in the social class, wholesale stores such as Costco, Sam's that you see to the right, and specialty and niche stores. When I say that in metropolitan areas, they are such as the three, the main three, um, I am mentioning this because if you see here the difference between the number of stores of City Market and Guadalajara, Monterrey, the first, the first line that you have is Mexico City, the second one is Guadalajara, and the third one is Monterrey. So you see here how it's distributed. In Mexico City, there are 20 million inhabitants, so the the market is obviously larger. It does not mean that it's the only market with opportunity. As it's also larger, there are also um, a lot of uh, a higher number of products. So the, the, yeah, the, there are a lot of uh, more competitors here. But when it comes now, uh, the next please, Karen. I wanted to add here, for example, the niche stores and specialty stores. You see here uh, the green corner, El Palacio de Hierro, and Experiencia Gourmet, that is from one store that is Liverpool. Uh, the concept and business model of the stores is focused on providing a product uh, portfolio aiming for health, for example, in the case of the green corner. Um, they are really focused in the respect for nature, fair trade, responsible consumption, and some in Mexico even take in consideration the ancestral wisdom. And for example, in El Palacio de Hierro, I have a photo in the next slide, but I will explain this now. Um, it's more like um, imported products and the high quality products that are, import that are being imported into Mexico. So the characteristics of the consumers that the, of these uh, last three is that they are, they are more in, aware of the ingredients, they would like to help local producers and uh, fair trade uh, producers, and the health effects of the products purchase is also one important factor to consider. And they, uh, the, one of the main drivers that we discovered is the willingness to contribute to a better environment in general. So, uh, the next please. Thank you. These are photos uh, that I, do, I, I personally took and went to the supermarket. The one that you see into the left side is the one from La Comer. And this photo is, I, I, I really like to share this photo because you see importados is imported products. And then you see other label uh, in the top that it says gourmet. So it's important to, uh, to have this um, difference between these two labels that the supermarkets are announcing. Uh, the way organic products are marketed varies between just gourmet and sustainable. So in regular supermarkets, you see this section, they are portrayed as gourmet and also like natural food section and close to the gourmet section, but they are all in the same. Uh, and, and it's important also because maybe your product is not organic, but it would be standing in the next to shelf with an organic product or, or our uh, official certification. And into the right uh, side, you see a photo of this specialty store, which is Liverpool. And also I, would, I wanted to show this photo because um, at, at the, I don't know if you can see it, but it, it says Experiencia Gourmet. 
So they are marketing these experiences as a higher, uh, a valuable time, a valuable product, a valuable product that they can offer only uh, there for you. And the photos that you saw before of the male bateaus of Van der Mullen were to, taken in this speci specific store. And last but not least, uh, there is a, I wanted also to add this example of stove baffles that are sold in a wholesale store. So this package was adapted to be sold in this um, yeah, in this format. It was a, a, a big box with 24, I think 24 packages, individual packages of stove baffles. And then you would have the individual package. So as you can see, and to wrap all the information up, uh, it, opportunities rely here in Mexico is the, the stores exist now and the e-commerce is a really really important channel to sell these kind of products now even more than ever be, because of this uh, global pandemic situation so I think I uh, next please so yeah uh, these were only the conclusions uh, like a brief and quick look to this so if you are, would like to add some, ask some questions or some comments, please feel free to ask. And I hope you enjoyed this presentation and the photos that I had, I have just showed to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sheila. Um, I uh, received a question from the audience. So I just wanted to clarify that uh, the report is uh, a public document and it's open for anybody to have a look and see what, uh, what your specific opportunities in Mexico will be. Uh, we will be sending uh, an, a link uh, to the study, uh, to a web page where you can download the study uh, together with the follow-up email uh, of this webinar. Uh, so quickly, uh, Sheila, before we go any further, we had uh, two questions which kind of complement each other. Uh, from Jose Manuel Esparza Serrano and from uh, Claudie, uh, and that is, is there any brand or product that is being sold with fair trade? And if so, how much does it differ in price in comparison to more common products? And additionally, it is, apart from fa fair trade, does Origin also give a plus and are Mexican consumers willing to pay more for it? For example, Belgian chocolate. Okay. So regarding the first question, I, I don't have a specific example of a European product with uh, the fair trade label, but yes, there is a, as in these uh, stores that I just mentioned, there is a lot of there are a lot of products with this category, and the difference in the price is around I think thirty percent higher. But as people, uh, these stores that I mentioned from, I don't know, the green corner, the physical store is placed here in Mexico. Well, there are six in Mexico City that are located in the, the upper uh, higher social class, uh, say it so. And uh, the, 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 as I just mentioned, the, the income is really different. It has huge difference be, uh, between our area and Mexico. So they, they are willing to pay. And the green corner, I think, is now I think eight years or so. So they, their growth has been uh, seen dramatically here. And regarding the fair trade, yes, uh, there is, with this free trade agreement, for example, um, there are some measures to protect against the imitation of uh, some European foods that has this denomination of origin. So the answer would be yes. People who, have, who see this label and uh, trust the, the as as long as they they announce in their labeling specifically the information where it does it come from and they meet the requirements. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, there are a few more questions, but I think that some of them uh, would be better oriented at some of our other speakers today. So we will get to those in a little bit. Okay. Uh, for now, I would like to give the word to Daniel Reitzma. He will be speaking about the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on the food and beverage business. Dan? Yes, hello everybody. Um, Karen, the next slide, uh, please, where I quickly introduce uh, myself. My name is Dan Reitzma. I'm uh, one of the co-founders of the Holland House uh, in Mexico. And when I have some time available, um, I also represent the uh, Frisson Campina cheese and I'm an uh, active importer 
the exporter of food products uh, in outer Mexico. I've been in Mexico for uh, 17 years. In a total, um, uh, I have a 25-year experience in international food distribution. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about the COVID-19 impact on, uh, on, on the food industry, uh, specifically in, uh, in, in Mexico. On the next slide, please. We've all seen the, had the headlines uh, in, in the newspapers. Uh, we, we, everybody lived uh, had uh, the same pandemic in the, in the, in the whole world. And um, well, it, it is uh, clear to everybody that, that, that what's happening is having a, a huge impact on, uh, on, on our lives and, 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 and on our business. Uh, and um, things are changing quickly. And uh, I will um, um, give you my view in the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes about how this is impacting the food business in, the, in Mexico. Um, uh, the headlines uh, are pretty shocking as, as, I, as I copy a few of them. Uh, for example, uh, uh, millions of people coming into poverty, more people coming into poverty in Mexico. Uh, uh, th th this will change our, our cons uh, permanently consumed behavior. So let's uh, take a, a deeper look in that. But first of all, in the next uh, slide, I would like to do a little poll uh, to see in uh, this audience uh, what, what we think about uh, the, uh, the Dutch food exports to Mexico. Uh, do you think this will continue to grow in the coming years? You will see a, a poll coming up. And um, uh, option one is if you believe no, uh, the, um, the, the food business will decline due to the crisis. Option two is uh, if you believe it will remain stable at best. And option three is yes, it will grow. <clears throat> mainly due to the potential of the market uh, and the, uh, the new uh, free trade agreement that, is, uh, that will come into effect in the next couple of years. So take a, a look at the, at the questions. Uh, what do you think about the, the, um, the Dutch food exports to, to Mexico? Will it uh, decline? Option one. Will it stay more or less stable? Option two. Or will it grow due to the potential it has? Give you a few more seconds to, uh, to fill out the, the poll and to um, so we have a, a, the best um, perspective. Okay, <clears throat> we'll uh, present the, um, the, the poll a little bit later on. On the, on the next uh, slide, um, I, I identify uh, four major shifts that impact the food industry. And Karen? And I will go through uh, each one of, uh, one of them. <coughs> and the first one is uh, the changing of uh, consumption patterns. But before I go into that, on the next slide, please. Um, in, in this environment where almost everything has changed, some things have not changed. And that's a question we get a lot uh, in Holland House. Uh, is business still going on in Mexico? Can we still do, uh, do business in, in, in Mexico? And the answer is yes. Uh, at no time, uh, the airlines have, st have stopped flying between Europe and Mexico. For example, uh, KLM has now five direct flights between Amsterdam and Mexico. Air flying, Air France has uh, resumed daily operations. Uh, so the, 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 the airlines are open. The roads are open for, for transport of goods. They've never stopped in Mexico. Uh, the import export from Mexico is uh, continuing actually quite normal. Uh, uh, there's hardly any logistic uh, disruption. Uh, so. Mexico is open for business. It is more difficult to travel now for, for, for persons, but, but the flow of goods is, uh, is, is continuing. And on the next slide, we look at some, um, some of the changes in, in consumption patterns we, we see. Obviously, one huge change that we, uh, we've seen is that uh, before, uh, there was a, a mixture of uh, balance between people eating at home and people eating out of home, where people would go for more special meals out of home and uh, the, the more practical meals at home. Uh, people would have lunch around the office, people would eat in schools. It all has changed. Almost everybody has started to eat at home. Um, and that is a, a, a big game changer. Yeah? Uh, and, and a good proof of that is to see that, uh, that, the, that the recipe uh, search term in Google has spiked to an all term high. Uh, you can see some of the, of the, the top 10 most search recipes. Uh, which, uh, which can give you uh, some idea about the uh, level of gourmet that people are looking for. But at least people are more interested in, uh, in uh, discovering new things to cook at, uh, at home. And this is a trend 
that uh, that is happening at the moment and that will, uh, have, will, will, will keep having an impact during this, uh, this pandemic. On the next slide, we see some other uh, changing uh, consumption patterns. Uh, uh, for example, more, more focus on healthy choices. In a recent study of uh, 23,000 people in Europe, 70% says they will make a greater attempt to eat healthier in relationship with uh, COVID-19. Uh, so people are indeed looking for healthier things because they are aware of, of the link between health and, uh, and, uh, and food. Uh, so that means that, that they will, there's an increased consciousness regarding their purchases. Uh, in a study by Accenture, uh, they, they say that uh, consumers are more mindful of what they're buying. They're striving to limit food waste, shop more cost conscious, and buy more sustainable options. Uh, so people are looking at food with a different uh, view than, uh, than before uh, the crisis. And the last point, uh, people spend less time in stores uh, because they know that, uh, that safe space is a home, um, they want to avoid crowds. Uh, so purchase decisions are driven by trust and reliable choices. Uh, extra precautions are being taken by most consumers heading to the store. And nearly 60% of consumers say that they're worried about shopping in store. And as a result, 85% are taking one or more health precautions. And this, these include uh, disinfecting the hands, uh, shopping carts, uh, or shopping at times when there's less people in the, in the, in the store. Next slide, please, Karim. Another huge um, impact is on the supply chains of, uh, of food. Uh, why is that? As I mentioned, the food service sector has dropped uh, hugely because people uh, don't eat out of home uh, anymore, or, or a lot less eat more at home. So what does it mean for the industry? It means that the pack sizes are extremely different between what an industry delivers to, uh, to a food service channel, to a hotel, a restaurant, uh, or an airline, and what, what is being consumed at home. And I'll give you an example from my own field. We see uh, a small pack of uh, sliced uh, Gouda cheese versus a 15 kilogram block of uh, industrial cheese. You can imagine that the, uh, the, the consumer packs uh, we are out of almost out of uh, out of, out of stocks, and, and, and the factory is uh, is uh, working uh, hard to, to to produce these. And the other ones are laying in a warehouse because uh, the, the clients who buy these big uh, volume items are are, uh, are not there anymore. Uh, another example is in the USA, where milk producers had to open the valve, valves of their milk tanks due to the loss of food service sales, uh, while retail packaging lines can't cope with the demand. Uh, so this is causing a huge shift in the, in the, in, in the challenge for, for, for suppliers uh, to adapt uh, so quickly to the, to the change in, uh, in, in demand. Another impact on supply chain um, uh, is that it's a very different uh, business if you deal with retail or if you deal with food service. Uh, one, of, one item is the different margin and cost structure. Uh, the selling cost in retail are very different than the cost structure in food service. Uh, and changing from one to the other one uh, implies many changes uh, to look at before you can actually uh, move between uh, these, these two sectors. Also, the sales and marketing approach is ex ex extremely different. Uh, in food service, you deal with a professional buyer, while in retail, uh, you also deal with a buyer. But in the end, uh, you deal with the end consumers uh, who goes to the supermarkets and, and you as a supplier get uh, access to the supermarket to sell your product. You have to sell it. And uh, it is only a sale if the consumer buys it. Uh, so a very different approach between retail sales and uh, food service sales. And another point uh, that uh, some, uh, we'll go back one, uh, Karen, some supply chains are uh, affected by coronavirus, uh, especially the labor intensive uh, uh, supply chains uh, like meat and, and, and poultry, where a lot of people are working together in, in, uh, in meat packing warehouses. Uh, they, uh, a lot of them have been affected in the US and in, in, in Europe, and that is impacting uh, the, the, the supply uh, of, 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 of these, uh, these, these products. And in the next uh, slide, we see another uh, evidence of the impact on the supply chain. Uh, and even though you can argue that the total intake of, of, of food and calories uh, will not change significantly due to the, uh, due to the crisis, uh, it does disrupt the markets uh, and for example, commodity prices uh, have gone crazy uh, over the last couple of, uh, of, 
of, of, of months. Uh, and this leads to, uh, to, to speculating consumers. It leads to, 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 to people delaying their, their, uh, their purchase decision or, 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 or purchasing more. And other people can't have it. So uh, just the insecurity affects uh, our, our supply chains and make it more difficult to, uh, to plan ahead. And, 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 uh, and uh, with all the, the, the basic security that, uh, that we used to, uh, to have is, 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 uh, is gone. So every company will have to deal with, uh, with a lot more insecurity. In the next slide, we also see uh, an, an impact on the sales channels. Uh, where and how do consumers shop? Uh, it will be no surprise to you that you see that, that supermarket sales, e-commerce and local stores, uh, they have a huge increase in, uh, in, uh, in, in shopping uh, uh, volume. Whereas open street markets, a uh, small store where it's cramped inside uh, or stores, the airports and train stations uh, are suffering hugely from this, uh, this, uh, this, this situation. Um, uh, in, in, in my experience, uh, supermarket sales in Mexico, uh, they show an increase of, uh, of 50 to 60 percent in, uh, in, uh, in, in volume, whereas uh, um, uh, street markets uh, show a de decline of, of almost 70 percent. Uh, you can imagine that airports and train stations, they uh, will even uh, decline more. Uh, so a big shift between uh, the, the places where consumers look for, for, um, for their, uh, their products. One of the items I want to highlight is the uh, is the e-commerce uh, e-commerce has been with us for for quite some time and people are very used to buying uh, airline tickets uh, tickets for uh, for events online um, maybe even some some household uh, goods but but food and groceries was the the lagging category because people always prefer to go and see it and go to the market and, and choose their own uh, piece of, uh, of of sausage and, 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 and vegetables uh, but this is changed uh, dramatically now. Uh, you can see that uh, in, the, in the, uh, the chart, I see this from the USA, uh, that uh, from 15%, more than 55% of people are now buying groceries online. Uh, and this will, uh, this is here to stay. Uh, maybe not in the same amount, but people will continue to buy more, more uh, products uh, online. Uh, also in Mexico, 48% of consumers buy food online. Uh, of which 38% are first-time buyers, uh, so many will uh, continue to buy products uh, online. So, so focus, keep, keep a good eye on what's happening in, in e-commerce because this is a, a channel that is uh, greatly benefiting from, from, from this, this situation and will uh, probably continue to be uh, a major player in the, in the, in the, in the future. So uh, as a summary, uh, the current market conditions are industry shocking boundary breaking we as business uh, managers and leaders uh, we need to adapt to new, cir new circumstances uh, we need to uh, be flexible and adjust to the new reality without breaking uh, we need to keep a close eye on our cash flow production lines our customers and make sure that everything stays uh, stays intact um, uh, but be flexible because everything is, uh, is different uh, and where possible a skill with the market because there are opportunities people that continue to uh, have to eat and, and, and consume uh, products and so uh, there are many interesting opportunities then i will focus a little bit on the uh, say a little bit about the, the, the broader economic environment specifically the, the crisis that we uh, that we're in on the next slide current please uh, as we uh, discussed uh, the, there's a short medium term impact that uh, impacts our food service channels uh, greatly it will come back but the options are divided uh, of how long it will take some say that it will, will last for two or three years before people uh, consume as much outside as they did uh, before but for, for, the, for the short medium term it will have a huge impact on us uh, the severe economic downturn will also affect the general economy and uh, specific sales in, in, in lower class uh, segment uh, unemployment will lead to less spending power uh, and, uh, and, and consumers tend to, to save more money in, in, in terms of, uh, of, of prices so it will affect sales in, uh, in, uh, in general um, but also very important is uh, the payment delays and risks and that is something that we all deal with uh, Mexico has always been a, um, a tricky country for, for foreign suppliers uh, had to, to 
to have our, our invoices paid uh, because our producers are uh, late in, in, uh, in, in, in paying uh, their suppliers. Uh, and this is only getting, uh, getting worse. Uh, the, the risk of late payments and even non-payments is, is bigger than ever. Uh, so be very careful uh, because uh, a few customers who don't pay can have a huge impact on, uh, on, on your own business uh, and can even uh, lead to, to bankruptcies. Uh, so take a very good uh, look at your customer and, and stay in, in touch with him and, uh, and manage this part very, very carefully. Then uh, a silver lining, two silver linings for Mexico, because it's not all, all negative. Uh, the first one is that Mexico is a very resilient country. Mexicans are used to crisis. Uh, they have had uh, many crises, uh, some caused by, by internally and, and some externally, but Mexicans are, are, are used to dealing with crisis and they're not easily shocked by it. Uh, so they uh, easily adapt and, uh, and move on to uh, uh, as much as they, they, uh, they can. So this is a country that very quickly bounces back. Another silver lining is the new free trade, free trade agreement with Europe uh, that will uh, spark new business after uh, probably 2021, but uh, the Eric will uh, go in, into more details uh, about that. Well, thank you for, uh, for your time. If you have any questions, please, please put them in the, in, the, in, the, in the chat box. And Karen, I'm not sure if we have time left to answer a few. Thank you, Dan, for your uh, insights. Um, there's one question I, I'd like to uh, uh, direct to you right now, and then there's a, a few more questions which are a little bit more general. Perhaps we can talk about these at the end of the presentations. Uh, the question is from Mikaela Anderson. She's asking, is there any GMO certification for European products, particularly dairy, actually present in certain products sold in Mexico, and are these products higher priced? Uh, I'm not aware that there's any uh, GMO certification that are working in Mexico that are recognized here. Um, so so uh, you can only work with the European certification and that will be mostly unknown to, to Mexican consumers. Uh, but, but it might help to have it on the pack. Uh, so consumers might recognize it, but uh, I don't think there's, a, there's an uh, agreement between uh, the countries uh, for, for, for these certifications. Thank you, Dan. And then well, there were also the, the results of the poll that we uh, didn't really discuss that much anymore. Uh, but I think that uh, the, the, the viewers are, are very much in line with what you uh, presented then. Uh, the majority of people think that uh, indeed the exports will grow due to the potential of the market and the, uh, uh, the FTA. And speaking of the FTA, I would now like to give the word to Eric Plessier from the uh, Dutch Embassy here in Mexico City. Eric? Thank you very much, uh, Karen. Uh, my name is Eric Plezier. I'm the agricult agricultural counselor at the embassy here in Mexico City. And I will uh, present to you the, um, the EU-Mexico agreement and the, uh, the impact on Dutch food retail products on the Mexican market. Next slide, please. So I will um, go into some of the details. Well, not the details. I will spare you the details, but uh, some of the highlights of the trade agreement, um, and then uh, into the implications that it can have for uh, for European food retail products. And we'll also take a look at these retail products, uh, and specifically what we are exporting at this moment from Europe to Mexico, from the Netherlands to Mexico. I don't know if there's any questions, but for now, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, I'm afraid that we're running a little bit short in on time. I would like to invite our uh, presenters of today to also have a look at the chat. There are some very interesting questions. I think some of them can be answered uh, via chat as well. So if you could please have a look there, that would be great. Uh, moving on. Uh, I would hereby like to introduce uh, Ana Laura Mercado, who is going to be speaking about the NOM 51. And therefore, I would also like to say a welcome to all of the people joining us um, through the Italian and the uh, Swiss Chambers of Commerce here in Mexico. And also thank you very much to my counterparts, Fadiba Gallardo and Christian Michel, for your uh, involvement in the organization of this webinar. Uh, so welcome, everybody. Um, Ana Laura, are you ready? Yes. Yes, thank you. 
So do, do you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Thank you. Perfectly. So I will be speaking about the amendment to the NOM 51 about the labeling of prepackaged food and non-alcoholic beverage. The, it's all about the commercial and health information in the labels. Next, please. Um, so I will be touching these three, uh, 10 points, the background. So you can, uh, please the next uh, label, please. Yes. So a little background, uh, we have a change in general health law that basically says that for a problem we have in here in Mexico is regarding overweight, obesity, and the type of food we eat. So the Mexican government government make this change in the law that for for food labeling, it states that uh, we have to have a simplified system of information to show the, the consumer what they are eating. So that was the um, main point of this change. Uh, in the 8th of October, uh, we have a project of the, uh, of the amendment to this norm, and it was for general public to, to make a comment in this. And finally, in March 27, we have the final amendment to the official Mexican standard for food. Next, please. So this uh, new norm will not be entering into force just in one step. It will have two steps and three phases. The first step will be entered in the 1st of October and it's just about uh, having a frontal labeling system, which are the stamps and some um, precautionary uh, legends. Then the, uh, in the 1st of A uh, April, all the other points of the, of the norm will enter into force. And then, <laughs> sorry, my dogs, and then it will have a second phase and third phase. And the, what they are is that the, in the first step, we have a form of labeling the, the food that the, the law says that has an exist in any nutrient. And these phases has that change. So you can put the next, please. Thank you. Um, this is how um, uh, the labeling must have. The, all this information is what the label, the norm said that the label in any food has to have. A commercial brand, the name of the product, the, uh, con uh, content, the net content, the lot and expire date, the, respons the responsible for the product, the country of origin, the ingredients, the instructions, the conservation, conservation legends, and um, uh, the nutri uh, nutritional stamp. So that's all you have to have in your label. The next, please. So the main change that is you can see in this new norm is the front label system. There is these stamps, uh, oct uh, octagonal stamps. What this says that, uh, or inform the people that the product that you have in or that you're buying has an exceed in calories, sugars, fats, or sodium. So there are five stamps that could be put in your product if uh, you, you exceed any of these um, nutrients. The next, please. How do you, knew, you know that, that your product exceed these, these nutrients? Well, this is the, the three phases I was explaining before. So in the first step or the first, uh, first phase, you have this uh, nutritional profile. And each uh, in, in each step or each phase, 
they explain how much is too much. So for example, if you have a cheese and your cheese has uh, a lot of fat. So this says that 10% of the total energy, if, if it comes from fat from your um, cheese, then you have to have a stamp that says that, ha that it has a, an excess on fat, unsaturated fat or trans fat. It depends. So the, all the phases, the one, the, the second and the third, are nutritional profiles that in the first are not, is not so restrained. The second is a little bit, a little bit more, for example, in, in the first one you have for liquids, uh, if you have more of 10 kilocalories from uh, added sugars, you have a stamp. In the second stage, if you have less or more than eight kilocalories, then you have a stamp of exceed of calories. So that's, that's, that's just the, um, the difference between the first phase and the second phase. If you can put the next one. So if, um, here we have other two um, legends and another five seals. These five, five step uh, stamps, you can use it if you have a product that is too small. What is small? Less than 40 uh, square centimeters. If, you, if your product is l very little, you can put all the five stamps because it's, they, are, will, they will be too big. So uh, the law says that if, if, if your product is too little, then you can put just one stamp saying that you have an exceed, an exceed on one or two or three or four or five of the nutrients we, we see before. The second is um, in sweeteners, in sweeteners. If you have any sweetener in your product, it doesn't matter how much you have, but if you have it, then you, you have to put this uh, legend, precautionary legend that says that it has sweeteners and is not recommended for children. The, the last one is that is the legend of it has caffeine. If, it, again, if your product has caffeine, it doesn't matter how much caffeine they have. If it has it, then you have to put this, um, this legend that says it contains caffeine and it has to be avoided for children. Children cannot um, take this, this product. The next one, please. So we have uh, products that um, they, are, they are an exception of these uh, seals or stamps and legends. Which one are um, the ones that are a single ingredient like water, like um, sugar, honey, uh, uh, vegetable oils, for example, doesn't matter if they have a lot of fat or a lot of sugar, they, are except, they have an ex exception for these st stems. Herbs or spe uh, spices or mixtures, um, coffee, teas, uh, vinegars and human, human water for human water, please. <clears throat> and infant formulas or milk for babies. So that's the products that will be, have a, they'll have an exception to this stamp or legends. Next one, please. And we have some restrictions added to these uh, stamps. If uh, first of all, if you have any uh, seal, you can have uh, other uh, legends that says that your product is healthy or is organic or things like that, because it's important in this, in this change on, in the law that if your product has an exceed on any of these new treatments, then there's other seals about health it can be put, uh, they can appear in your, in your product. 
if you want, if you don't have any seal and you want to be, to put these, these labels about a recommendation or a, or a recognition by a professional organization, for example, that uh, it's healthy and it's, it's good for your heart and for, for you to put this, then you have to have an, an organization that is recognizing Mexico for uh, that endorse this, this claim you put in your, in your package. It's very important that this organization is recognized by Profeco. Profeco is, um, it's the Federal Consumer Protection Commission, which will have to um, endorse the, these, um, this organization that have, that they give you the permission to put this kind of, this kind of recommendations in your label. So you, you have to be very careful with these recommendations. Okay. You can have it, of course, but you have to be very, very um, careful to, to ask an, an, an expert that um, endorse these, these, these legends. Next one, please. Other restriction for food that have the stamps, the, the octagonal stamps, will be that they cannot be for the consumption, consumption for children. So the, the norm actually says the prepackaged product that bear one or more warning stamps cannot put or include uh, children characters, animation, cartoons, celebrity, athletes or pets, interactive elements, anything that promote or encourage the consumption for children in any form, in any part. So very careful uh, for how you present your product. If it has any of the seals, you can't put it for children, okay? So that's basically what this pun says. The next one, please. This is uh, how you will see what Eric was saying about the uh, protection to the name, for example, the, the, how the, the norm says it will do it is by the name of the product will have to have the word imitation if it not complies with the, the original product. For example, what you say about uh, go the cheese. If it's not go the cheese, then they have to have imitation, the word imitation in the begin in the upper upper left part of the of the label. And below that, you have to have the name of the product they are imita imitating. So that's the, the way you will see this this law in the um, new product that are not the original product or the real product. Also, for uh, products that have an official Mexican norm that regulates its name, like uh, chocolate, we have a, a specific norm for chocolate that regulates its name, they have to have the, uh, the norm logo. Is, uh, this logo, will, it's like the logo you, you see in, in all the, electronics, you have a logo of NOM, and that logo means that that electronic complies with the, um, with a NOM that it will not explode, it, it, it will function to you, it will not harm you. So that's the, the, the same feeling for food. If you see the NOM logo, it means that this food complies with the specific NOM for that product. For example, in chocolate, if you see this non product, uh, non logo in a chocolate, it means that it is real chocolate that complies with the norm of chocolate and it's not more sugar or more grease or, uh, excuse me, fat or something else and has a little bit of chocolate. No, no, no. It's 
its compliance with the name of uh, with the name of the uh, chocolate and have a specific um, percentage of chocolate of of fat or uh, dairies and everything to be a real chocolate so that's the importance of this uh, logo nom logo um the next one please we have a little changes in ingredients and because is uh, it's one of the ingredients we have in the stamps the sugars must be declared in the ingredients like added sugars and in in parentheses we have uh, you have to specify what free sugars you put like um, sugar cane honey another kind of sugar or is not cane sugar what it is so you have to be very specific in what kind of sugar you are putting in your in in your in your product and for food allergens you have to be it has to be very very um visible if you have any allergy allergens in your product like soy gluten milk and the norm has all the 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 recognized allergens but well if you have any of those then you have to put it uh, in equal or greater size of the ingredients and in bold okay so that's just a little uh, changes in the ingredients next one please and the form that you will present the nutritional information. This is a chart and that you will see in the NOM. It's just how you could put it. You can put it in any way you want, but the information has to be this one. Uh, what are the changes? First is that all the, the nutritional information must be for uh, 100 grams or milligrams, not other, uh, a portion. If you want to put your your inform uh, nutrition information in other portion, like 40, because you recommend just eating uh, 40 grams or or 150, whatever, you can put it an extra, an extra information. But you have to put all the information for 100 grams or milligrams. Why? Because what they are trying to do is to um, make it easy for the consumer to uh, read this nutrition information, which in this, um, in all the, the other changes in the norm, they couldn't do it. They, they saw that the, the normal population did not understand the nutrition information because all the nutrition information was in, the, in different proportions. So and if, uh, if you want to buy one chocolate from another, one chocolate has a nutrition information for uh, 40 grams. And the other chocolate you buy, it uh, uh, has a nutrition information for um, 100 grams. And so they, it's not easy to see if you, what you are buying. So this change is for that. All the, the labels you will see in Mexico, uh, from the 1st of April, we'll have the nutritional information charts for 100, uh, 100 grams or milligrams. And, and all you, you see in, in blue are just tiny changes in the, in the information, but it's all charts and all your rheumatologic the stories will have it. You already have it. You just have to put it in your uh, products. Next one. Well, that is it. You have a lot of questions, I think, but we can help you with the changes on in your in your labels. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ana Laura. Uh, I see that we are a little bit over time. Um, there is something I think is very important to mention, and it's also one of the questions of our audience. Uh, they are asking about the certification of compliance uh, with the new norm. Uh, that's probably something I should have mentioned in the beginning. Uh, that is exactly what Cooperativo EO does. Uh, they, they um, well, perhaps you can fill me in a little bit, Ana Laura. Uh, but they specialize in helping companies uh, getting everything ready for the new labeling. 
so they, they do a, a part which is assessment, uh, and then they can also help with all of the, the paperwork necessary. They can help with the design uh, for the new labels, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Anna Laura, if you could fill me in a little bit more. Okay, you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Yes, we can help you with that, with designing, with, uh, uh, we can start with saying the if your um, ticket, uh, with your ticket, with your label, if you need to have the stamps or not, we have, uh, we can uh, also help you with uh, if you don't know how to make a change and but you already are in Mexico, we can re-stamp or relabel all your products here. We can all do that for you. We can do um, uh, we can do a a, a bit uh, a little bit of uh, like in the in the label you could make uh, for example all all these uh, um, how do you use a uh, last the claims we can help you a little bit with the claims you have in your product for being complying with this new norm. And thank you, Anna Laura. So the question is, is the certification uh, of the norm compliance, is that mandatory? I think the answer is yes, but if you could please confirm. Uh, yes, it is mandatory. If you don't have it, then Profeco could have, uh, uh, could put, uh, could take your, your your product out of the market if you don't comply with this norm. Very well, thank you, Anna Laura. Um, and then Eric is saying it is not a certification as such. No, you need to comply, but it's not a certification. So what you need to, to get in order is that you have a certi certificate of compliance rather than a, a certification. Is that correct, Anna Laura? Yes, exactly. You don't need a certification. You just need a certification if your product has a specific norm. If it has a specific norm like chocolate, for example, then you have to have a uh, certification. If you don't, then you don't need to. Yeah, exactly. It, so the compliance is not the same as the certification. Certification exactly. is one thing and you need to comply to the norm. Exactly, exactly. Um, Here in Mexico, we have a lot of norms, specific norms for a, a specific product, uh, food products. We have a lot, but that's why you have to, uh, we can help you with that being or tracing if your product needs a norm or has a norm or just with the uh, norm 050, you know, it's okay. Thank you. Uh, Sheila, I think you would like to add something here? Yeah, just to make sure, uh, I will just share this photo that I have here with the NOM that was previously, uh, which Anna Laura just shared. But, uh, give me a second, please. Yeah, can you see the photo now? Yes, thank you. Yeah, this is just an example of a product in the supermarket. If the norm, as just another explained, must have the 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 norm 051. So if you see here, this is uh, these are Canadian cookies, but the label must be in Spanish, must uh, comply with the details that Anna Laura explained. But this is an example of uh, how you must have this. Uh, you must comply with this uh, with this norm. It's there. There is no option actually. If you don't comply, then as Nara said, the product would be taken out, or in in some other cases, they apply some fines to the to the producers. Thank you, Sheila. Um, I, I see that there is still some discussion going on about uh, whether or not something is 
uh, a certificate or a compliance, uh, I think it would be uh, best to invite you to uh, uh, contact us. Uh, that's also uh, already on your screen right now, I hope. <laughs> um, yes, there, there is a lot of, uh, I know that there are a lot of doubts about the, how to comply to the, to the uh, updates on the norms 50, 51, uh, and um, perhaps you're already doing that without knowing, etc. Uh, we are here to help you. So please, if you have any further questions, make sure to reach out either to Sheila or to me. Our email addresses are right here. Uh, we will also include the uh, contact information of Anna Laura uh, in the email that we will be sending you after this webinar. And uh, well, we look very much forward to uh, helping you uh, be more successful on the Mexican market. And with that, I would like to uh, say a big thank you to the people who have made this session today possible. Uh, thank you to NL and Business for allowing us the opportunity to, to do this sector study and to see what the opportunities really are for Dutch companies in the Mexican market. Thank you also to our embassy here in Mexico City. Uh, thank you to uh, our speakers from today. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Eric, for your contribution and also Anna Laura for your insights. And uh, also, lastly, thank you to um, the Italian and the Swiss Jam who've also been joining us this morning. Uh, I wish you a happy afternoon and for those of you in the Netherlands, a good evening. Goodbye. Bye bye.